Well, once again, good morning. We're resuming our study in 1 Samuel, so would you please turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's quite likely that we'll finish the book of 1 Samuel sometime in March, if I had to guess, and then we'll go back to where we are in the New Testament, which means we'll be in 2 Corinthians on Sundays, uh, starting sometime in March. Well, this morning we find ourselves in perhaps the most famous, if not one of the most famous accounts in all of the Bible, David and Goliath. And the title of our message this morning is simply Fighting Our Battles. Anyone in here have any battles that they had to face in 2022 or even in 2023? We're going to see what the Lord's word has to say to us this morning about it. So before we dig in, would you bow your heads and your hearts with me one more time as we seek the Lord's blessing? What an honor and privilege it is, Lord, to have your word at our fingertips. Lord, this is a, uh, a section of scripture that can almost betray us with its familiarity because we know how it plays out. But Lord, we ask that through your Holy Spirit, you would speak to us in new ways that you would reveal things in our own hearts. Lord, that you would transform us into your glory. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Well, again, it's been a couple of weeks with the Christmas holiday, and then we had a special New Year's Day message last week. So it's been a couple of weeks since we've been in 1 Samuel, so we should just take a couple of moments and remind ourselves where we're at just to kind of get our footing for what's taken place. If you remember, Saul was told by God, King Saul, that he was going to lose his throne because of his repeated disobedience to God. And after that, the prophet Samuel then anointed a young man named David as the successor to the throne. One day, a little shepherd boy named David would become the king of all of Israel. And after his anointing by Samuel, do you remember what David did? He did not order a new set of business cards that said, King elect. David did not grab a chariot and race through the streets of Bethlehem saying, I'm God's choice. You're looking at Saul's replacement. That's not what David did, is it? No, David awaited further instruction by God. See, at this point in David's life, his responsibility wasn't armies or battles or even kingdoms. His duty was to care for the sheep that God had given him. And this is a theme that we repeatedly see throughout the scriptures. Remember, it's being obedient and faithful to wherever God has called you. And then he gives us additional areas of responsibility. Let's dig into our study, re reading verses 1 through 3, 1 Samuel 17. It says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Ezekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Now the valley of Elah is about a mile wide, and there's a brook that runs about 20 feet wide that cuts through this valley. And this brook actually overflows through the rainy season. If you ever get an opportunity to go to Israel, we take you to this valley. And I have with me this morning a stone I picked up from the Valley of Elah. Who knows? This could be the very stone. This is not. You know what they do if you ever go? So many tourists take stones from there. They bring in truckloads, five-ton truckloads from other areas and dump them all there. And then the tour guide will say, maybe this is the stone. It's not the stone. But you can see, left side, right side, those are the two mountains, and the valley is in between. That's the setting for David versus Goliath. Verse 4. 
And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. At nine feet, nine inches tall, Goliath is only three inches away from bumping his head into a regulation basketball goal. There's no shortage of skeptics today who question the, val the validity of Goliath's size. Yet it's interesting. There are non-biblical historians who have also reported and recorded men of just astronomical size. Herodotus, Diodorus, Sicilus, and Pliny the Younger all mention people who are seven cubits tall. In fact, there was a man named Robert Wadlow who was eight feet 11 inches tall when he died on July 15, 1940. See, Goliath's height may seem strange to us, but it's certainly not without precedent. Verse 5, he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. When you do the translation, his body armor weighed about 125 pounds. And a coat of mail consisted of metal strips that was sewn together by leather. See, Goliath's armor had the strength of steel, but offered flexibility and mobility for battles. Verse 6 and 7. Now he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and its iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Imagine throwing the spear. It'd be like throwing a balance beam that gymnasts use. It'd be two and a half to three inches in diameter. And the head of the spear alone weighed 20 pounds. So just imagine the strength it took to throw this spear. How do we put this in context? Will you ever see the Olympic Games or track and field events and you see those real big guys or gals who have the shot put? and you load the shot put, and they need all that momentum to spin them around to get the shot put to fly, a shot put only weighs 16 pounds. The spearhead weighed 20. Verse 8 and 9. Then Goliath stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to fight me. If he is able, verse 9, to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. You got to remember that ancient warfare is not like today. We're mesmerized by the scenes, if you've seen them, of Ukraine dropping drones almost with pinpoint precision, dropping these little grenades and hitting. That's not like it was. It was brutal, bloody, hand-to-hand -hand combat in these days. Even the victorious side in battle would suffer mass casualties. So, rather than fight a battle, sometimes armies would bring out a champion, the best of the best, to square off with their champion in a no-holds-barred match. See, the thinking would be that even if our, quote-unquote, our side lost, we'd still live to see another day, albeit as serves, serves, I don't know what a serve is, either as slaves or servants of the other kingdom. So Goliath obviously was the Philistines' choice, right? Goliath was never last pick when it came to battles. So they bring him out in front. He's their choice. And he taunts Israel. He says, send out your own champion to fight me. Look at verse 10. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. 
If you were here a few weeks ago when we talked about Saul and his appointment to kingship, we learned an interesting detail about Saul. Do you remember what it was? Who was the tallest man on all of Israel? It was Saul. King Saul was the one who came closest to matching Goliath physically. But Saul and all of Israel are cowering in fear. You know, psychological warfare, psychological fear is a powerful weapon in war. In World War II, German fighter planes would use a high-pitched siren when flying to lower the morale of their enemies as they performed their air raids. In the Iraq War, the United States used the shock and awe campaign to psychologically maim and break the will of the Iraqi army to fight. Even more recently, in recent years, in Iraq and Afghanistan, United States counterinsurgency uses heavy metal music and incredibly loud decibels to confuse and scare local militia. Goliath is bellowing from across the valley, and no one from Israel responds. They're terrified. They're paralyzed by fear. The scene now shifts to David. Let's read verses 12 through 15. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, Next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. Verse 15. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So remember, we studied this a few weeks ago. David had been in Saul's presence as he would play the harp and minister musically to David, right? Remember, we talked about worship and all those things a few weeks ago. But now here we pick up the scene where David has gone back home to Bethlehem and he's taking care of his father's sheep. Verse 16, the scene shifts. And the Philistine, speaking of Goliath, drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. It was incessant. It didn't stop. Now, it's interesting, if you do a, a word study on the number 40 in the Bible, it's often associated with testing and trial. That is the number 40. Remember, rain pelted Noah's ark for 40 days and 40 nights. The children of Israel wandered the desert for how many years? It was 40. And how long was Jesus tested in the wilderness for? 40 days. Verse 17 through 18. Then Jesus said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp. And carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. So David's dad has three sons in war, and he wants to know what's happening. Right? There's no phones, there's no telegrams. So he sends David to run out, bring provisions, and then report back what's going on. Verse 19 through 21. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David arose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to the fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. So why don't you just try to picture the scene in your mind for a moment. John Paul, can we get that picture of the Valley of Elah back up there? Thank you. So imagine you're young David and you're running. You got the loaves and the cheeses. And you come to this valley and you see thousands upon thousands, perhaps 100,000 men ready to brutalize one another. The screams and the shouts, the tenseness of the situation, it'd be shocking to say the least. Verse 22 through 25. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, 
and came and greeted his brothers. Verse 23. Then as David talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. Verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from Goliath and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? They're speaking of Goliath. Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills Goliath, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. So Saul, King Saul had the authority and he offers a three-part lucrative reward to whatever man was bold enough to fight and attempt to defeat Goliath. First thing, the man would get great riches. He'd be like Scrooge McDuck swimming in all the gold. Is it Scrooge McDuck that does that? Do I have that right? I can't remember. I don't know why that popped up. Second... <laughs> The second reward, the man would get Saul's daughter in marriage. Hey, you marry the king's daughter, now you're close to the king. But perhaps the most attractive perk at all, look at the end of verse 25, a lifetime tax exemption for you and your family. That's a pretty good deal, right? Yet nobody is courageous enough to step forward and fight Goliath. Verse 26 and 27. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Verse 27. And the people answered David in this manner, saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. David shows up on the scene, hands off the supplies, talks to his brothers, and then hears Goliath bellow. Who will fight me? All that business. And David can't believe his ears. See, Goliath wasn't just waging war in Israel. He was defying the living God and blaspheming God Almighty. And no one from Israel did a thing about it. And David is stunned. He's shocked. Verse 28. Now Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And Eliab said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Please notice the significant opposition that comes against David before he even picks up a stone. It's David's own brother cutting him up with these brutally harsh words. Remember the scene. Here's Goliath acting like the mouthpiece of Satan himself. He's taunting Israel. He's mocking God Almighty. And Eliab wants to fight his little brother and he's mocking him? Tragically, this is a scene that is often repeated in churches today. Even in the face of the lost world all around us, and with the end times upon us, some folks in the church prefer to battle over insignificant things, and they do so by cutting one another down. It's tragic. Here, Eliab accuses David of being a show-off. Notice that dig. He says those few sheep. David, you can't do anything. You only even have a few sheep. You know, it's always especially painful when your family tries to douse your faith. 
At times, the biggest opposition to faith isn't the ridicule or even the warfare of the enemy, but it's the skepticism of a loved one. Oftentimes, that hurts even worse. We're going to spend some time on verse 29 because it's critical. Look at it with me, please. Verse 29. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? I would encourage you to underline that word now because it demonstrates that this was not the first time that David's brothers had horribly treated him. And David is hurt. What have I done now? You get the sense of exasperation from him. At this point, many of us, certainly myself included, would be absolutely staggered from the pain of this hurt from a loved one. But David's following words are key. Look at the verse again. He says, is there not a cause? These words are critical to the events that are about to unfold. See, David's not concerned about his own glory. David's not concerned about his own success. And David's not even all that concerned about trying to defend himself in front of his brother. David's concern is for the glory and the success of God Almighty's cause and plan. It's right here at this moment that this bellowing, intimidating giant named Goliath is a dead man walking. This is where the battle was won. You see, if Eliab's hurtful words could get David in the flesh and step out of the spirit of God Almighty, if Eliab's hurtful words could get David to turn the focus upon him and his hurt and his pain and focus all on himself, then what would happen? David's strength would be all gone. But in the midst of his hurt, in the midst of these insults and pain from his brother, David focused upon the Lord. David was more concerned about the cause of the Lord than himself. Notice he says, is there not a cause? It's for the cause of the Lord. And at this point, little does Goliath know he's a dead man walking. Verse 30. We're at verse 30 and 31. Then David turned from Eliab toward another and said the same thing. Notice that. David turns from his brother and says the same thing. Is there not a cause? Isn't anybody going to do anything about this? He's blaspheming God Almighty. Look at the end of verse 30. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Verse 31 is also critical. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. To be clear, David is not bragging. He's not boasting. He's saying, Put me in front of Goliath, and I'm going to whip this giant's butt. It's going to be a show. That's not what David's saying. So what's happening here? Why were David's words reported to Saul, and why were David's words so impactful that the king sent for him? Because David alone is courageous, while everyone else is fainting in fear. Everybody notices David's courage. You and I find ourselves in very similar circumstances today. There's a lot to be afraid of, isn't there? Everything going on with Russia, China, our own country is falling apart at the seams. Morality standards just falling by the wayside seemingly every waking moment. Inflation's out of control. $5 for like 18 eggs? This is nuts. We could all sit here and say, well, what about this? And we could work ourselves up into a frenzy this morning with all the things that we're concerned about that we could even say we're fearful of. But as followers of Jesus Christ, we know the end of the story. Amen? Amen. We win. We win. Hallelujah. 
And when you and I keep our eyes on the Lord, we remember that this world is not our home. I love what it says in 1 Peter, it describes us as pilgrims. Hey, we're just passing through, partners. This is temporary. So absolutely, we can be courageous in the midst of all the turmoil, in the midst of all the fear, in the midst of all the things that could happen. We can absolutely be courageous because we know one day we'll be in the presence of our Lord. And when we have that courage, it's not a bold break of Joshua, it's anything I've done. No, it's what Jesus Christ has done. And when we have that courage, you know what happens? People notice. They say, why aren't you afraid? Don't you hear? Oh, I hear. I don't care. What do you mean? Well, my Lord is in control. You want to know a great way to be a witness? Keep your eyes on the Lord, trust in him, and let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, Matthew 5, 16 tells us. Verse 32. So David is now in front of the king. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant, he's talking about himself, will go and fight with this Philistine. You know, it's one thing to say somebody's got to do something about the problem. Everybody says that. We all complain about things we say. Somebody should really do something about that. That's not right. It's one thing to say something about a problem, but it's a whole nother thing to actually rise up and do something about it. Verse 33, and Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Remember, King Saul has waited a long time, at least 40 days, for someone to step forward and say they'll fight Goliath. And now someone has said it, but it comes from the mouth of a youth. Saul's looking at the tail of the tape in his mind. Giant Goliath, little David, and thinking, there's no way David could win. I got to tell you, these next three verses, I think are the, it's the third section of scripture I ever memorized and administered to me in ways that I can't even describe for you. And if you've forgotten this passage of scripture, perhaps you'll discover it for the first time. We're going to read it slowly. Verse 34. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Verse 36. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Verse 37. Moreover, David said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. As a shepherd facing lions and bears trying to steal a sheep, David had no idea at that time that he was actually in basic training to fight a giant. Yet now, hindsight being 20-20, David could look back and know that the same God who delivered him from the lion and the bear, that same God will deliver him now from the hands of mighty Goliath. In the midst of our preparation, we rarely know how God is going to use it in the future. But God does, amen? The question is how we respond in those moments of trials and storms and calamities. Verse 38 and 39. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put on a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. 
David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. It's fascinating to me that King Saul is not brave enough to fight Goliath himself, so he tries to do the next best thing and give young David his armor. But there's a problem. The armor doesn't fit. And this makes sense, right? Remember, Saul, super tall. David, a youth. Can you imagine trying to wear, like, like he's like, I can't do that. And there's a critical lesson here for you and I. If the Bible and prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit have strengthened Christians for centuries, sustained believers in the throes of death, worked miracles, won victories, even slain giants in Jesus' name, why do we ever think we need to adopt the latest Christian fad? We don't need some fancy new book. We don't need some fancy new technique. We need the word of God for it to be applied to our heart and for us to be surrendered to it. It's that simple, but oh, that hard. So rather than strap on another person's armor, we need to fellowship with the Lord and trust what the Lord has for us through his word. Verse 40, Then David took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag and a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistines. A question's been posed for many, many, many years. Why did David grab five stones? Well, we learn in 2 Samuel 21 that Goliath had four other brothers, so the thought is perhaps that David grabbed five stones, one for each one, but we don't know for sure why he picked up five stones. But I want to draw your attention to a different part of the verse, the end of verse 40. It says he drew near to the Philistine. See, faith is about to take action, isn't it? See, David could have said all the bold words. David could have renounced Saul's armor. He could have trusted in God's armor. And David could have grabbed all of his ammunition. But if David never went to battle, what would have ever mattered? Folks, remember, the Dead Sea is dead because water flows into it, but no water flows out. We all need to apply our faith. It can't just be all taking in. It's got to be pouring out. We got to let the Lord use us and stretch us. Verse 41 through 43. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, it's interesting, it says looked about, it's implying that David was so small, Goliath didn't realize that David was the champion that Israel chose. It'd be like me and some of you walking by, right? You're like, where's Brian? Oh, I'm right here. <laughs> Verse 42, and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth ruddy and good-looking, ruddy as red-headed. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. When Goliath asks, Am I a dog? Please understand, this is much worse than it sounds. The Hebrew word for dog is kaleb which implies, especially in the book of Deuteronomy, to a male homosexual prostitute. See, Goliath takes David coming out to fight him as the highest insult to Goliath's manhood possible. Goliath is raging. Verse 44 through 47. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. 
But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Verse 47. David says, then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save. You may want to underline this. The Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. It's one thing to believe in your heart silently. It's another thing to make a bold statement publicly, isn't it? And David here is bold, not in himself. David is bold for God Almighty. David knew that the battle belonged to the Lord. Verse 48, so it was. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, it's one of my favorite parts in all the Bible, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. So you can picture the scene, right? Large, lumbering Goliath moving towards David. And young David is running towards the enemy. David didn't run away. He didn't hide. Nor did David panic. In fact, shockingly enough, David didn't even drop to his knees to pray, did he? This can be a struggle for some Christians, this very point. Hey, is God supposed to do the work, or am I supposed to do the work? The answer is yes. God does it, and we do it. He works through us. Absolutely. Trust God and rely fully upon him, then get to work. And work as hard as you can. Run right at the enemy. It's how the work of God gets done. It was C.H. Spurgeon who said this, quote, The lazy bones of our orthodox churches cry, God will do his own work, and then they look out the softest pillow they can find and put it under their heads and say, The eternal purposes will be carried out. God will be glorified. That is all very fine talk, but it can be used with the most mischievous design. You can make opium out of it, which lull you into a deep and dreadful slumber and prevent your being of any kind of use at all. Absolutely, there is a time to pray, 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 and then pray more. Prayer is critical. There is a time to pray, but then there is also a time to act. Verse 49. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. Everyone else thought Goliath is so big, he's so strong, there's no way I can defeat him. David says, Goliath is so big, I can't miss And he runs at him. He's got the sling. It's not a slingshot like we have, right? Swinging it around. All those years of preparation as a shepherd, using the sling to chase away animals. And it catches Goliath right in the forehead. So much so that the stone, it says, sinks into his forehead. Think about it. A slingshot is nothing compared to the weaponry that Goliath possessed, right? But interestingly enough, some scientists have done studies. The stones in the Valley of Elah are made of barium sulfate, which are heavier and denser, making the stone like a little missile that just absolutely flew. Verse 50 and 51. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that the champion was dead, they fled. 
God had given the victory. Verse 52 to 53. Now the men of Israel and Judah rose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sherim, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. Notice the Philistines had agreed that they would surrender if Goliath got killed, right? They said, you'll be our servants if we win, and we'll be your servants, right? But that's not what happened, is it? Please note, the promises of Satan never come out as he promises. That's how Satan works. The devil never fills up to his promises. That's how sin works too, isn't it? Let's finish the chapter, verse 54 through 58. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in the tank. Can you imagine just walking around with a giant head, like, How big was that thing, right? Verse 55. When Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, so notice Saul, King Saul, saw David go out against the the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner says, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Now this brings us to a difficult moment in our text. Because we just studied a few weeks ago that David was appointed Saul's armor bearer and David played worship for Saul. But here it seems like Saul doesn't know who David is. So what's happening? Well, there's a lot of different theories. Some think that perhaps David played his music behind a curtain or a screen of some sort. We don't know. Others think that because of the distressing spirit that Saul had, that he wasn't in his right mind. Possibly, we don't know. We also know that David didn't spend all of his time with Saul. Remember, he's back at Bethlehem, so perhaps a significant time period of elapsed. You know, teenagers, they grow and change in just a matter of months, right? So perhaps that's what happened. We don't know for sure. But I want you to point out, I don't want you to point out, I'm going to point out. I'd like to point out that David had no idea that he was the forerunner of the one who would leave his father to be born in Bethlehem in order to save us from a Goliath of an enemy who wants to destroy us. Jesus Christ comes from the lineage of David. It's fascinating to me, even more than the incredible events of David slaying in Goliath, it's amazing to me the faithfulness of David who is simply being obedient to an errand that his dad had for him. That's how all this came about. Remember, Jesse said, David, go bring some food and see how the battle's going. And David could have protested. Dad, don't you know I'm the future king? I'm no DoorDash driver. Let those guys find their own cheese sandwiches. I got to get ready to take the throne. That's not what happened, is it? David just obeyed and served. All from a simple errand. And this is often how God's directions come. We may be looking for some spectacular sign from heaven in a neon light or even a mysterious voice in the night. More often, though, God speaks to us through the everyday occurrences in life. When we're walking with God and directed by his Holy Spirit, and faithfully taking care of the responsibilities that he's entrusted to us, God will absolutely guide our steps and direct our paths, and he will use us for his glory. I also find it interesting that this is not the last battle that David ever faces, is it? Sometimes we forget that. We're like, David beat Goliath, and that's it. No, that's not it. David will have many, many, many more battles as we continue to go through the Old Testament that we'll see. 
Here's a young man who killed a lion, killed a bear, and now a giant. And it's just preparation for what he's going to have to face in the future. I want to invite our worship team up as we get ready to close. Some of you this morning are facing your own Goliath, aren't you? The problem you're facing is big, and your problem is intimidating. You look at the tools at your disposal, and it doesn't even seem like they can make a dent. And your problem, your dilemma, is shouting at you constantly, day after day, incessantly, never stopping. And it's growling at you, and it's snarling at you, and your problem is telling you that you cannot fix it yourself. And the Goliath in front of you seems absolutely impossible. And it is for you and for me. Luke 18, 27. But Jesus said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Amen? Too often we think if it's a problem that's easy for us, well, then it's easy for God. But hey, if it's a problem that's hard for me, then it's hard for God too. But that's not so. He is Lord of all. Amen? Amen. And if he can bring down a Goliath with a stone from the hand of a youth, don't you think he can clear the way for the Goliaths we have in our lives? Some of you may be facing a diagnosis. Some of you may be facing financial problems or broken relationships. Whatever that Goliath may be, here's what I would encourage you to do this morning is to be like David. And make sure that your focus is on the glory of the Lord. Too often when we're facing our problems, it becomes so easy to get focused upon ourselves and how we feel and how we're hurt. Make your problem the focus of bringing God glory. Say, Lord, how are you going to get the glory through this? Keep your eyes fixed upon him. And the peace of God will come upon your heart. Would you stand with me as we close and pray? Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of the impossible. Lord, you are so faithful. I'm sure every one of us in this room and watching online and listening can look back in our lives and see all those times when things seemed almost hopeless, but you delivered us. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness then, and we thank you for your faithfulness now. Lord, would you draw us near to you? Lord, would you shape our focus that our eyes and our hearts may be concerned with your glory? We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you leave here today, I would encourage you to pray for one another to ask each other, perhaps even somebody you don't recognize, hey, how can I pray for you? I know it's awkward sometimes. That's okay. Get over it. (laughs) Because if you're not willing to pray for someone in this room, it becomes a whole lot harder to pray for a stranger out there. Amen? Amen. Let's give the Lord his praise.